Gordon of Khartoum. Charles Gordon was born in Woolwich in southeast London on the 28th of January 1833. He was the son of senior army officer Henry William Gordon and Elizabeth Enderbury. He was later educated in the Royal Military Academy of Woolwich. He was commissioned in 1852 as a second lieutenant in the Royal Engineers Corps and he was latterly sent to the Crimean War in the Russian Empire and assigned to the legendary siege of Sevastopol. He took part in the brutal assault of its fortress. Following the peace treaty, he was part of an international commission to map out the new border between the Russian and Ottoman empires. After Crimea, Gordon participated in the campaign of 1860 in China during the Taiping Rebellion against the emperors. A total war which was one of the bloodiest in history, estimated at 20 to 30 million deaths of both citizens and soldiers, 600 destroyed towns. At the head of a group of Europeans, he reorganized the imperial army. He stayed with the British forces as they occupied the northern part of China and throughout the next 18 months, Gordon's troops played a crucial role in suppressing the Taiping rebellions, saving the Manchu dynasty. Gordon wasn't corruptible and didn't steal the money that was for his soldiers, like a lot of mandarins. The mandarins didn't understand why Gordon didn't let his soldiers loot and plunder as compensation and the mandarins weren't happy that Gordon was always asking them for money to pay his soldiers. He returned to England in January 1865 with the name of Chinese Gordon. In 1873, he was appointed governor of the province of Equatoria, a region in the south of South Sudan. While he was there, he was much involved in abolishing the slave trade. Contrary to the Ottoman, Egyptians' oppressive and cruel rule that had no interest in putting an end to the slave trade. Gordon became close with the African peoples of Equatoria, such as the Newer and Dinka. They had suffered from the Arab slave trade and naturally supported Gordon's efforts to end it. Besides working to end slavery, Gordon also made a series of reforms to abolish torture and public whipping. Gordon later stated that he taught the natives they had a right to exist. Gordon left his Sudan post in 1880, exhausted. For years before, a Muslim cleric named Muhammad Ahmad preached about renewal of the Islamic faith and the liberation of the land. Muhammad Ahmad proclaimed himself to be the Mahdi, the prophesied redeemer of Islam. His jihad campaign was very successful, gaining a lot of followers angry at the Turkish oppressors. An Egyptian expedition was ambushed and killed, and Egypt started to worry. The Egyptian administration in Sudan assembled a force of 4,000 troops. However, the troops camped too close to the Mahdist army and they became overconfident. The Mahdi attacked at dawn and slaughtered the army man by man. The rebels of Mahdi took the huge amount of weapons from the dead Egyptian expedition. The rebels of Mahdi continued to grow and the British government of William Gladstone decided that Sudan wasn't worth the effort. And although Gordon was against Gladstone's Sudan policy, he was sent to Sudan to evacuate the British and Egyptians and leave Sudan to the Jihad revolt. The British public were delighted. By this time, Gordon was a hero and quite famous in Britain. Gordon never liked the fame and very rarely gave interviews. He became obsessed with martyrdom. He wished for death, seeing his death fighting the jihad at Khartoum as romantic and worthy. He wrote, I feel so very much inclined to wish it. Earth's joys grow very dim, its glories have faded. The Ansar rebels also were motivated by the thought of fighting the great famous Christian Gordon. And so it began. Upon arriving to Khartoum, Gordon galvanized the troops and set up the city defense of Khartoum. A siege began on March the 18th, 1884, commanded by the Mahdi himself with his 2,500 soldiers. Gordon had a low opinion of the enemy soldiers and their blockade was indeed poor. 
It is said that Gordon could have escaped easily during the first months of the siege, but he didn't even try. Desperate for martyrdom. The public opinion was that the British government should have sent reinforcements. And finally, in August 1884, the British cabinet voted with the objection of Prime Minister Gladstone to send reinforcements at a cost of £300,000. Gordon held the city. The defence of the city was well planned and it wasn't until December that the population started to die of starvation. There weren't any dogs, horses, cats left in the city because the people had resorted to eating them. Gordon offered the chance to leave to everybody, but Gordon himself wasn't leaving. He wrote, if any emissary or letter comes up here ordering me to come down, I will not obey it, but will stay here and fall with the town. Mahdi's forces took a fortress which allowed them to fire at the city and the city's defences were weakened. When Gordon was advised that he should turn the lights off in the palace to avoid enemy fire, Gordon acted defiantly, ordering all lights to be put on as bright as possible. In late January, the reinforcements were closing in on Khartoum, and the Mahdi, knowing this, ordered his troops to storm the city. They attacked, and after one hour's fighting, the city was theirs. Gordon himself died. The well-known account of his death is that Gordon, already settled on dying for the cause, got dressed in his uniform and a red fez, and he left his room to attack the Ansar forces. He was killed against the Mahdi's orders after running out of bullets and attacking with his sword. His head was cut off and put on a pike. He spent his last weeks writing obsessively in his diary. He became more and more obsessed with death, writing, better a bullet to the brain than to flicker out unheeded. The British reinforcements arrived two days later. The public lamented his death, hailing Gordon of Hartum and blaming the Gladstone government for his death. Chinese Gordon of Hartum, warrior.